online resource center dedicated to promoting awareness and collaboration among private sector businesses and academic researchers. And I'm your host. My name is Brent Schmidt, and I'm happy to be uh, hosting the panel today. Um, I'll introduce them in just a minute. Uh, but first, I'd just like to share um, what this Hangout is all about. So each month, our goal uh, is to present academic research solutions and how they might be commercialized. And that's really what our focus is today. Uh, other Hangouts are going to focus on uh, just general insights into trends and opportunities, uh, into uh, gamification, interactive display or user experience. Um, so uh, I'm asked to repeat the, the, the opening here, so that's great. Um, this is our first commercial uh, Commerce Lab Hangout, so we're, we're playing a little bit. This is our beta, so we'll have some fun today. Uh, and the Commerce Lab Hangout series is a production of the CommerceLab.ca, an online resource center dedicated to promoting awareness and collaboration among private sector businesses and academic researchers. And again, my name is Brent. I'm here to host the Hangout today, and I'm joined by an esteemed panel, uh, and look forward to engaging in a really productive and fun conversation today for the next 45 minutes. Uh, our, uh, our general focus of the Commerce Lab Hangouts is to present academic research solutions, how they might be commercialized, and again, in the areas of gamification, interactive display, user experience. You're welcome to join the conversation on Twitter or Google+. Uh, using the ha hashtag Commerce Lab. And our community community manager, Debbie, will be tweeting during the event today and looking for your questions and comments. And I'll do my best to uh, make sure we have time to uh, take as many as we can in the 45 minutes that we have. So our overall format today is we're going to see a presentation of an annotation and collaboration tool. Uh, for working with digital images. It's a solution developed by the faculty at University of Waterloo, and it's currently in the beta or test mode. So after we've seen the product and, and we've got some insight into its development, some of the backstory, I'll invite our panel to join us and uh, we'll dig into it and really try to understand it and uh, how we might help uh, the faculty and Christine, who's here to present it, uh, really take it to the next level. So I'm going to uh, introduce our panel just at a high level, just to uh, give you the, the quick quick one, uh, one-liners of who they are, and uh, then we're going to, I'm going to ask them to share a little bit. First uh, person in our panel I'd like to introduce is Christine McWebb. She's the Academic Program Director at the University of Waterloo, Stratford Campus, and Associate Professor of French Studies at the Faculty of Arts at University of Waterloo. She will be the one presenting this solution, which we're talking about today, which is called ImageMat. We also are joined by Rosa Lupo, a partner at Gowlings, a legal firm, and she's based out of Waterloo and works a lot with local startups. We're also joined by David Struk, uh, an executive in residence at the newly opened Stratford Accelerator Center, and he assists entrepreneurs through the whole startup phase of their business, and look forward to David. David's uh, insights and contribution today. And finally, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, to have actually a customer or a potential user of the solution. And Joan Coutu is a department chair of the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Waterloo. And so she's going to be bringing a potential user's perspective uh, and, and really look forward to kind of getting that, that real world kind of response to image mat. So with that, I'm going to just open it up to the panel and just ask the panel to share, um, you know, somewhere around 30 seconds. Just why why are you excited? Why are you why are you here as part of this this conversation? You could be doing anything today. So um, what what made you show up other than a lot of cajoling um, <laughs> uh, by the people that have asked us to be part of this? Uh, but uh, but other than that, why why are you excited and and, uh, and what do you look forward to in the conversation today? So we'll start with Christine. Okay. Um, well, hi, Brent, and uh, thank you for the introduction. And um, for me, this is really exciting because it's really the first time that I have the opportunity um, to talk uh, about the commercialization prospect for this tool. It's been in development for a couple of years now, but the history goes back quite a bit further, and I'll talk about that a little later. Um, so this, this is great. This is um, wonderful to have the opportunity to talk um, to colleagues and uh, the other panelists potentially Okay, thank you, Christine. 
And I'll just ask our uh, our producer there to if Christine's volume is could be turned up. I don't know if other people are hearing, yeah, hearing Christine as clearly. Or just maybe get a little closer to your microphone, that'd be helpful. Okay. Is this better? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that's better for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, great. That's good. Okay, Rosa, what about yourself? Why are you uh, excited to be part of this conversation today? Well, there was lots of cajoling to get me to be part of the conversation today, but uh, <laughs> I think the exciting part about today is uh, that it's a first, um, and I liked the format as well about somebody presenting an idea and a process, and then the experts and the advisors weighing in on how to make that process better, and I think that's the most uh, beneficial way for startups to figure out what to do is leading by example. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for being here, and uh, let's hear from David. David, what about yourself? Um, yeah, David uh, Strook's my name. I'm, as you mentioned, I'm with the Stratford Accelerator Center. I used to run a software company in Waterloo called uh, Nav Tech for many years, and since then I've been doing a lot of mentoring and uh, guiding of uh, technology startups in the region through the Accelerator Center in Waterloo, got Community Tech in Kitchener-Waterloo in the hub, and now um, uh, right now in the Stratford Accelerator Center, which is across from City Hall. Um, I, I think it's great uh, to help startups. I've been, I've been enjoying that for the last few years. Um, ultimately, I had a really good opportunity at Navtech that I I'm, feel very grateful that I, I got that opportunity. And, uh, and if I can give back to other people that have ideas and want to start something and help uh, them, them create uh, wealth for themselves and, uh, and make something that the world needs, and, then I want to support that. All right. Awesome. And what about yourself, Joan? Kind of give oh. us a brief intro in terms of what you're doing and why you're excited to be here. Okay. I'm, uh, as, as you said earlier, the chair of the Fine Arts Department, but I'm an art historian by training, so I spend a lot of time looking at images and analyzing images. And uh, unfortunately, most of my images are overseas. Uh, I work on hmm. monuments which don't move. Um, and also, it's critically important to have really good uh, visual images to work with and to analyze. So I'm intrigued by how this tool works and um, how we can zoom in on it, but also share with other scholars in uh, in my field. Thank you. And I'm excited to be here because uh, it didn't take a lot of conjoling. I, I spent a lot of time in conversations like this. Uh, just really, really excited to you know hear the customer's point of view and also like the development team and and one of the uh, one of the conversations I, I had recently with small businesses business owners was their desire for a dream team of experts that they could tap into and and this is what we have here today so this is kind of a, a unique experience and I think any developer of a solution would uh, we look forward to having you know the insights that you're all bringing to the table today so a uh, high, really high value conversation. So we're going to actually transition right now to show a video of the image mat uh, solution. Uh, so this is on YouTube, uh, and hopefully our producer can get that going and uh, let us know when that's when that's up and running. Uh, while she's uh, getting that going, why don't we just um, uh, if Christine, can you just maybe give us a little um, quick background in terms of the name and why you you know did you have different options or how did you come up with image mat as your as your name for the solution that's always one of the fun parts of developing anything new is kind of naming it bring it to life um, maybe just share a little bit about the naming process yes actually we we had uh, different options um, initially it was called uh, palimpsest <laughs> which I liked <laughs> at the time but I don't like it. I don't like it much anymore and a palimpsest is um, mostly in manuscript culture where you have overlapping um, art. So for example, where an old manuscript is repurposed and reused for a new text. So you have two different layers of, of text in, in, uh, on one and the same folio page, for example. So I, at the time I thought the name was kind of cool, but then I realized that um, it's probably not all that well known and what, what a column says this, so we, we gave that one up and then we came up with um, uh, image mat, eye mat, uh, different things like that. And the, the mat and image mat actually stands for uh, Margot Annotation Tool. And Margot is the umbrella organization, the umbrella uh, research project that I, I direct. Um, okay. So that's where that name comes from. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good. So is the video ready to go now? Thanks for that background. It's, it's always a fun process. Yes, it so is. I think that, yeah. 
I like problem set myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to change it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is the producer. Did we have audio before? We didn't, did we? Okay. We're gonna we're gonna start playing this video now. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so you can just let me know if it's this playing there, or uh, we can have it is Christine. playing. Can you it is hear playing. It? Okay, I can't see anything or hear it. Can anyone else? No. 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 So we've lost that. Okay. Um, As I said, this is our beta, so this is a good thing. <laughs> Do we want to have Christine just walk through it using screen share? Would that be better use of so. our time? Yeah. Okay. I think so. You, I'm going to stop. Okay. Are you going to pull up the... Sorry. Apologies. That's okay. There we go. <laughs> so are, are you going to pull up the, the video on screen share, or do you want me to talk about it? I was trying to pull up the video on screen share, but I'm not able to get it to play on the Hangout. Okay. Only on my desktop. So uh, if you are able to... Uh, give a verbal walkthrough of ImageMat, that would be great. Okay, so um, ImageMat is uh, essentially a web-based image annotation tool and the way it works is, um, like I said, it's, it's entirely um, web-based so nothing needs to be uh, downloaded um, and the way it works is that it, you copy and paste the URL of any image that you find on the internet. You copy that into the uh, workspace of ImageMat, and you add the image, which makes it visible. And there are two panes to the tool. So on the left-hand side, you can view the image, and you can then start to annotate it, um, either with uh, longer text in the right-hand annotation space, or right on the image itself. And I think that's one of the interesting uh, features of it, where uh, you have a, a markup tool which you can open up and using the markup tool you can insert text right onto the, the image. So for example if you have, um, let's say you have an image of a rose, you can uh, uh, annotate the different petals of the rose, you can annotate the entire rose and mark it up in different shapes and different colors. You can then save it and uh, you save it uh, to your own library so ultimately and potentially, you could create a very large database, um, which we have done during testing, um, a very large database of materials, um, of images, together with the annotations that you can then share with colleagues um, through creating a project. And you can collaborate uh, with colleagues and students, for example, on the different images. And they can either add um, more comments, they can add annotations, they can add images, uh, which everybody can then view and share. And this process um, of working together can be done either privately within one group, um, or it can be done publicly, so you can publish the annotations for everybody to see, uh, which I also think could be an interesting uh, feature because then it's kind of like a crowdsourcing. It becomes a crowdsourcing project, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of the, the usages, um, for now, we've been focusing mostly on research, so for academic research, but that is certainly scalable into other areas. And we have also done testing in classrooms as a, a teaching tool, so where the instructor can give assignments um, using the tool where the students can work on it uh, together. Um, and where the students can do peer assessment, for example, the instructor can use it as an assessment tool as well. So we, we've been focusing on those two areas, but like I said, um, the usages are certainly scalable into other areas, and that's actually, um, I think, something that we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it, maybe just, obviously, it's a very collaborative tool. That's what I'm, you know, I'm hearing. It's this very kind of mm -hmm. dynamic collaborative, collaborative tool. Can you, can you kind of step us back at the beginning? You were sharing a little about the naming, but... Um, did you develop this yourself? Do you have a team? How, what's kind of where did it spark? Where did the idea even start from? And maybe mm -hmm. kind of bring bring us from that day to present day, and then we'll talk about the future from there. Just kind of yeah. start us at the beginning. 
Sure. Um, so this this was during a, a graduate seminar. I normally teach um, in the French department and now, of course, at the Stratford campus, but I had the opportunity, this was back in 2006, so quite a while ago, I had the opportunity to teach a graduate seminar in the English department at the University of Waterloo on text and iconography. The point, of course, was to look at lots of images and discuss how the images fit with the surrounding text in medieval manuscripts. And I'll just explain this very briefly. Um, in a medieval manuscript, you often have uh, text, and then there are spaces where what we call miniature images or illuminations are inserted. And they either have something to do with the text, and sometimes um, they don't at all. They are actually completely outside of the, the written text in terms of the um, uh, content. So it's, mm -hmm. it's an interesting topic to, to explore with the students. Um, so I, uh, I got to a moment in the course where I had one of those moments where I thought, if we only had, <laughs> and this was the, the, the birth of, of, of the idea of image math. So what, what I wanted to do with the students was um, I wanted them to compare um, a large number of these miniatures that were in different manuscripts of one in, of one in the same text called the Romans of the Rose, which was a very, very, very popular text in, in the Middle Ages. There are still, to this day, 300 manuscripts um, uh, that are extant, which is quite remarkable for, for uh, the time period. Um, mm. So I tried to figure out a way how, how to show students different miniatures at the same time and do a comparative uh, exercise on it. So for example, uh, iconographic features, uh, themes, and that sort of thing. And okay. very quickly gave up because it, it just wasn't possible. I mean, you know, to do that even at a scale of 15 to 20 images, it just didn't work. So I was frustrated, and I had two very bright graduate students in the class, and we, during a coffee break, uh, we were sitting outside, and I said, what if we, if we had something like, and I began to describe in extremely vague terms, kind of this dream. And that's where it all started, and one of the graduate students, actually her name is Diane Chikaki, and... Um, she has since gotten her PhD from, from that department and has moved on, but she has uh, been, ever since 2006, she's been involved as the web designer for okay. the Mahbou project and then for ImageMap. And I'm not a coder. My, my PhD is in literature, so I mean, I can, I'm now at the point where I can talk to programmers and web designers, but, you know, I, I couldn't code <laughs> a, single, a single line. So, <laughs> so I, the only resource I had was to get money um, to get this project off the ground. So I applied for mm. grants and uh, was successful. And um, so for the last three years almost, um, I was able to hire uh, a couple of programmers on contract. And then Diane, who was the web designer. And then a little later, uh, at a later stage, I was able to hire a postdoctoral fellow. And she, like Joan, is an art historian uh, uh, working in, in medieval art, and uh, she came to us from the University uh, Complutense University in Madrid, and she was fantastic, and, and she really helped with um, creating annotations of a test database that we have on the Mahbou site of medieval miniature images. So we actually okay. created quite a bit of content. There are about 600 um, annotations that, that we have created on, on different images. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that, that was our so where, first, where, yeah, no, go ahead. I was going to say, so where, where do you see it going? What's your kind of, when you, when you sit back and kind of dream with your, with your team about where, what's possible for this? What, where, do, where, um, do you see, where, do you, where would you like it to go? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the next phase really should be about app development. I want to turn this into, into an app. Kind of like um, uh, Dropbox and, and uh, Evernote, you know, apps like that. Um, mm -hmm. That work uh, when you're online, but then that you know that sync automatically when you're online, but um, that you can also use as an app. So that's I, I really think that would increase um, the functionality tremendously. Okay, so I, I want to uh, open it up to the panel now. Just you know, we've got that kind of quick context, and and I think we've all seen seen the video that other people can watch uh, later. Um, the link has been provided on Twitter. Uh, and it'll be on the Google Plus page as well later, so you can uh, you get more information. And there's also the, your website, um, which which will be I'm sure linked to this uh, conversation. So um, I'd like to just hear um, first, actually, from Dave uh, in terms of 
kind of that development process that Christine and the team went through. I'm just curious of, of how similar or different that is from other entrepreneurs um, that you work with, you know, outside of the academic world and also how might be, you know, what are some of the similarities and differences? Sure, sure. Well, the first thing that is, uh, I, I would say, is actually different than what, uh, in what they're doing is different approach than what oftentimes comes out of academia. Uh, what we've, what I've often sometimes seen when projects are coming out of universities, uh, th they typically are trying to solve different problems than entrepreneurs are trying to solve. They're trying to solve some experimental, um, you know, thing or pure research or something really interesting scientific, and they don't actually come at it from the perspective that an entrepreneur uh, entrepreneur does, which is solving somebody's problem. Um, this, in this case, um, they actually were trying to solve somebody's problem, which which is good, and uh, and I think that will help them get, get on the right path. Um, so that that's one difference that we oftentimes see out of academia, and oftentimes um, there are a number of examples of projects that got going out of the University of Waterloo that struggled for quite a period of time because they didn't realize that they had to solve a different problem. And it's not something just pure scientific. They actually have to solve uh, a user's problem. Um, so that's something a little different. In, in this case, they have actually solved a user's problem, and, and that's that's what uh, how it started. But the next step for uh, for them, I think, is to go through a market validation exercise. And we have at the Accelerator Center, we actually have a sort of specific program that we walk uh, companies through to do this, and it's it's geared around. Um, trying to th think of different users of the product, what their particular or potential product, what their specific problems are that you're trying to solve, and then ad identifying the key things that your product has that meets those problems, and then uh, going out and testing that through uh, either surveys or alpha beta tests and things like that, so you can verify that somebody will actually use this and give you money for it. Um, and I'll tell you, I. I see lots of people come in with what they think are great ideas that solved one person's problem or a friend's problem, uh, but then when they start to go through a market validation exercise, they realize that the market really isn't that big, or lots of people think it's interesting, but they're not willing to give you money for it, and that particularly we see a lot in the uh, app space right now where um, you know, there's lots of there. There are lots of apps that people are interested in, but they're willing to pay a dollar, and you, you got to sell an awful lot of apps to uh, to make uh, to make a business when you're when you're getting a dollar for things. So, mm -hmm. so w we try and, and uh, get people going through a market validation exercise to answer a lot of those questions. Who would use it? What would they pay for it? What is different um, about our product than other people's products? And and while th this is sort of an interesting product, and I did see the video in advance, uh, there are some other people out there that do somewhat similar things. Um, and I, actually, I didn't really see one that was very specifically the same as this, but there are some other people mucking around in this space, and you got to make sure that you're differentiated against them. So uh, I've talked about a few things there, but um, yeah. I think that the next step is to really go through a market validation exercise uh, answering some of those very specific questions. I think Thank you, David. Are, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah go, Christine. I think your, yeah. your points are really good, um, David. And uh, let me know where I can sign up for that um, market validation. <laughs> that, yeah, sure, seriously, sure. I would love to do it. And just on on uh, potential competition for for ImageMat, um, the one tool that I've been looking at quite closely is uh, Flickr. Now has an annotation space, which is mm -hmm. not it's not quite as developed as as ImageMat in terms of. Um, the markup uh, uh, features that, that we have in image map. But, um, so I, I'm, I'm fully aware that um, there, there's quite a bit of uh, potential competition out there. Sure. For, well, for those in uh, Stratford, um, if you go to the Stratford Accelerator Center, uh, which is across from City Hall in Stratford, um, we, we can uh, talk to you about getting a program going there. Uh, and also, if you're in Waterloo, we can go do it at the uh, Waterloo Accelerator Center as well. Um, yeah, to, to your point, uh, Flickr, there, there are a lot of people now mucking around in this space of how to collaborate with other people with web content, not just images, but web content in general. And uh, e even in our own Waterloo region, there is a company 
company called Group Notes that was part of the Hyperdrive program okay. with Communitech um, that is doing uh, online sharing, uh, collaboration of, of, of comments that you can link to specific elements of a website. Um, so it's not too different from this, and I don't certainly they didn't have the amount of um, functionality that you have on your product, but there, there's even one locally that's mucking around. Now that's not to scare anybody. In any space, there's always lots of competition, mm -hmm. and uh, but that's why you go through a market validation exercise to figure out what makes you different than the other people, identify the people that will give you money for your differentiation, and is that market big enough? And then ultimately, how do you get to them? So. Um, so th those are some of the issues. Mm -hmm. That's great. great. Can we? Oh, I'd like to hear from Rosa in terms of some of the the legal questions uh, as you were listening to Christine uh, share. You know her, what this product is about, and obviously we're sharing this with the world right now. So there must be some process that has already gone, gone had you know been in place to get us to this point to be able to share it. Can you maybe give us your perspective? Uh, you know, as as someone as Christine is in the team have gone through a, the development process. At what points does it make sense to engage with someone like you to really think about intellectual property and, um, and you know and when when it, when does it make when can you share things and how do you share them to protect your yourself and things like that? Yeah, thanks, Brent. Um, I think uh, two points. I just wanted to uh, elaborate as well on what David said that. Um, as a service provider talking to a lot of tech startups, uh, there are a lot of them that think that they have the only game in town. And I think uh, taking a real hard look at what your competition is and who's out there and a broad look on that as to who can be competition and the people that can just change direction slightly and become your competition, although they're not now. Um, I think you have to look at that very critically. Uh, and as far as uh, legal counsel and getting involved in some of the things, the processes to make sure you have in place, um, one of the key things is to ensure that you have non-disclosure agreements at the appropriate time through your, uh, through your growth and your development. Um, the, uh, the key thing there, and I think that academic, academic uh, startups face this more than others, the issue is that uh, there is a uh, real pressure to publish in academia. Um, and once you have published publicly uh, your technology, then in some jurisdictions like the U.S., that shortens your time period during which you can file a patent. Um, so that means that in the U.S., you have one year from uh, public disclosure to file a patent. And if you're not careful about when that disclosure happens, you may have started the clock ticking and miss out on your time period. And I think academic developers kind of get tripped up by that more than your regular entrepreneur because of that pressure to publish their, their discoveries um, that exists in the academic world. Um, the other thing, uh, Christine touched on the fact that you know she, she's not a developer, she doesn't write code. Uh, a lot of our tech startups may not be the person writing the code, they have the idea, they have maybe the business background, they've identified the problem, but they do have to engage third parties to get them to a product that's launchable and usable. And, uh, and the key thing there is to make sure that everybody that you engage along the way, whether they're employees, they're consultants, however you engage them, to, but to be sure that you have an assignment of any intellectual property that they have developed for you, either to you personally or to a company, uh, even better yet. And that way, um, there's, there's a clear line in the sand that although they may have developed it and they may have rights in that, that uh, IP because they've actually created it, that it's being assigned to you because you're paying for it. So I think those are some of the key top three things to be sure of. When you disclose, make sure you have non-disclosure agreements and make sure you have IP assignments and waivers by anybody who's assisting you. And what That's would you say, Rosa, is the, big, the biggest pitfall that you see? Or the, or um, I think, yeah, three? I think one of the biggest, uh, there, there's a couple, I think, in a lot of startups. Um, one of the bigger pitfalls is to assume that you can sign the IP waiver and assignment and not pay anything for it. Um, and uh, and there is as well 
there's a lot of belief that sweat equity is okay and it is okay for founders um, but when you have a true third party employee who's getting only options and not getting any pay uh, that is contrary to legislation in Ontario believe it or not and a lot of startups find that surprising because everybody does it um, and you can do it as long as you get away with it but uh, but if somebody makes a complaint to an employment standards officer you will find yourself paying them at least minimum wage for the services that they provided you really can't contract out of that and that is a trip that most startups fall into that they think that you can always pay in options and not pay for anything and if you want to enforce your IP assignment and your waiver of moral rights from your developers you should pay some sort of money to get that right to get that assignment um, it shouldn't just be free and I know that most startups are cash strapped and hence the desire to uh, have sweat equity and do things for free but um, but it may cost them down the line and it doesn't have to be a huge sum of money uh, it can be some nominal amount but pay something Okay, Christine what are you hearing there that is maybe new for you that is, uh... Um, I, uh, well, first of all, Rosa, thank you very much for, for that advice. That's, um, uh, that's really, really helpful. And um, the IP issues with regards to my uh, collaborators um, were addressed really, really early on, so I, I was quite aware of it. Um, I was, uh, however, not um, aware of the, the payment that, that you were just explaining at the end, so that, that's something that's really, really good to know. Yeah, um, and I think I have a, a little bit of, of learning to do there. Well, everybody does. So, <laughs> and so you had asked the question, Brent, about when to get somebody involved. And I think um, you know, there's different levels of involvement uh, with your legal counsel or any legal counsel. There are great programs through the accelerator programs, through the accelerator center in Waterloo and Stratford, um, through other programs, uh, other tech communities in the area where you can have a sit-down chat probably with uh, myself or other legal advisors very early on to kind of get your ducks in a, war, a row and be aware of what issues you're going to be facing and how to address them without really your legal counsel taking pen to paper and and uh, starting to uh, starting to build to be frank it can be a initial chat and um, and having a bit of a discussion so that you're aware of the issues as Christine said there's some learning and those learning uh, those things to learn are usually fairly uh, basic and, uh, and and can be set out in the initial stages so right from when you're starting a startup whether or not you're ready to proceed to a patent or not or whether you're ready to hire your first employee it's useful to sit down with somebody and chat about what your plan is and get some practical advice and get some practical um, trip points to make sure that you're aware of when you hit them. Okay, thanks Rosa. David, Brent, you have a thought there? Yeah, Brent, I just wanted to add something to, uh, to something that uh, Rosa touched on. Uh, she, she highlighted the, uh, the comment that Christine made about that she didn't know anything about development so she had, to, she had to get some people to do that stuff for them. Um, that is a very typical problem and it's not just in the early stages of this of the uh, product on the development side that is a typical problem that entrepreneurs find when they start getting into HR and organizational development issues when they get into sales issues and, and channel development and they get into marketing those are oftentimes things that they're not experts in and those are things in particularly with high-tech uh, startups where competition can come out of nowhere very quickly, it's very difficult to make a lot of mistakes in those area or waste times in those areas and still ultimately be successful. So one of the things that we oftentimes recommend people do is when you're starting to get into those other functional areas that oftentimes develop um, after the startup's been going for a while because the first bit is on developing the product, um, it's oftentimes beneficial to not try and learn it yourself and be successful but go and get uh, professional help or people that have been there and done that before. Um, so, and, and that doesn't mean you have to hire people. Uh, you can do them as, get them as contractors, you can get them as mentors, uh, but don't try and do all those other areas yourself. And that's something mm -hmm. I just wanted to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I think most entrepreneurs try to spread themselves too thin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
let's turn it to you, Joan. Let's uh, you're the the potential user of this tool. So, uh, can you just give us a quick uh, uh, background in terms of what exposure you've had to ImageMat and uh, and how how might you see using this type of solution in the work that you're doing? Okay, uh, I haven't had a lot of exposure to it. I saw the video earlier and uh, okay. some information sent earlier, but I, I got a I think a basic sense of it. Um, I guess I have a few questions, but also some observations in terms of how this could be used really effectively. Uh, one Great. question I had, Christine, uh, you talked about it being a collaborative uh, initiative. I can see that working really, really well, um, particularly with people uh, working in a similar area around the world. Uh, can people work on it at the same time, so use it as a kind of uh, communication and collaboration at the same time? Is it simultaneous okay. use? <clears throat> mm -hmm. So right right now, um, what the functionality that we have for for that is that um, people can work on the same image, not in real time. So for example, if you and a colleague are are annotating uh, are annotating an image, you would have to do your work, post it back, and then the next user would have to um, add to it, edit your work, post it back, and so forth. Okay. But in, in the next phase, the uh, real-time um, synced collaboration is something that we, we plan to add to it. But currently, that is not possible. Okay. Uh, because I can see uh, that uh, real-time um, mm -hmm. uh, working Definitely. really well for uh, yeah. uh, asking questions with mm -hmm. each other. Um, in my case, and, and I think probably in your case, a lot of our colleagues are, are working around the world, so um, it's hard to send attach an image to an email, send it back and forth, and exactly. um, it gets very, very uh, time-consuming and difficult, and just the communication is awkward. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can see this working in a number of ways. You, as you, uh, uh, you work on uh, medieval manuscripts, um, I get quite a few questions from, for example, Sotheby's and Christie's, uh, when they're uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, authenticate works of art. Uh, usually, mostly drawings, and some of the it's some of the material is really obscure. Uh, and again, it's a situation of going back and forth. Now, this kind of uh, 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 program could uh, facilitate that enormously. So I, there's a potential within the the art market, I think, as well. Um, so moving beyond the academic circles. And I don't know if you people are aware that uh, there's thousands of medievalists out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they, they all congregate in Kalamazoo, Michigan, once a year at yeah. a large conference. <laughs> but, but actually, to to that point, um, I recently had an opportunity to. I, I've demoed this tool in its various stages several times, but the most recent one, of course, I had the most complete version of it, and um, that was at a at a conference uh, called um, uh, Haystack, and it's not the Haystack, but it's written H A S T A C. And it's a digital humanities uh, uh, um, collabor uh, collaborative uh, uh, group that um, organizes a conference yearly. And the last one was in Toronto. And, and so mostly people were from uh, libraries, from uh, uh, archivists were there, a lot of art historians, a lot of uh, fine arts uh, people, and lots of students. And um, there seemed to be quite a bit of interest uh, in, in amongst those groups. Uh, but another area, and, and I'm not sure, I'd actually like to, to hear your opinion, Joan and the others as well. Uh, another area that I've been thinking about is the medical field, because um, that's a very image-heavy area, for example, for sharing x-rays and uh, working collaboratively on analyzing um, x-ray images, um, which of course now are all digital. And um, I don't know, like I, I've been thinking about uh, the, the medical field being uh, showing quite a bit of interest in this kind of tool. And I know that they already have these tools, but they're usually extremely proprietary and very, very expensive. And um, so this might be an alternative option. Mm. Yeah, in that respect, the markup capabilities are, are really quite wonderful. Um, mm. And uh, just sharing the information between researchers or academics and, and the medical field. Um, as a teaching tool, I can see it being potentially very useful, again, for the markup tool, because the normal practice for uh, teaching, uh, lecturing about uh, visual images is to use a PowerPoint. And it's, PowerPoint's terribly static. You can't do much with it. Uh, you have to stand there and you know, get a laser pointer and point things out, um, not very effectively. 
so this provides the opportunity for annotating the image, but uh, it also has zoom capabilities as well. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, now, your work, and I guess the sample body for the, the, the project here are medieval manuscripts, which are flat. Um, is there, has there been any thought about going 3D with it? Because I work in sculpture. Hmm. Um, and uh, as do, of course, a, a lot of uh, art historians. And that's always been a challenge. Um, and as I said, I said earlier, I work on monuments. So I have to go to the monuments to really see them. They don't move. Right. <laughs> so um, if I have 3D images, that would be uh, uh, really potentially very effective. Mm -hmm. We have we have not thought about it at this point, but that is a, that's a that's a, a very interesting idea, I think. Um, so, John, what do, what do um, what do you think uh, your other academic researchers would would think about this solution? Well, again, I I like the idea of the collaboration and uh, that it can be done worldwide because it is uh, so difficult to get together. Uh, the only time we actually have the opportunity is at a conference. The conferences are, you get up there, you present a paper, and even at the conference there's not much collaboration, in effect. Mm -hmm. um, I work in the area, um, and there's really only about four other people in Canada that work in that area. And we're spread across the country, but also uh, it's a much, much richer field in Europe. Um, so I can see this being quite useful that way. Uh, the other thing I know, uh, I know uh, lots and lots of academics who work in the visual have built up through their research uh, huge numbers of images, uh, a massive uh, catalog of images that they work with. Certainly they'll publish, uh, but they'll only use some of those. And uh, so in a sense we have all this, uh, this uh, material that would be good to get out there in some kind of public forum. And traditional publishers are not going to accept uh, catalogs anymore. Um, because of the cost of publishing. And okay. to, to be able to load, I, for example, I've got thousands of images of sculptures and drawings of sculptures. To be able to, to load that onto a database and just release it out there for people to use is, uh, uh, would be incredibly useful for other researchers. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing a lot of value, Christine, out of this, uh, this opportunity. This is, this what, are you, what are you hearing, David? Well, that's what I was going to say, is that, uh, Christine, it sounds to me like you've got somebody here that is an ideal customer, at least in, in, some, uh, in one of the markets or a couple of the markets that you've looked at. Uh, uh, Jones commented on uh, Sotheby's and some other people that might be users. I, I think the question that you, you might want to take offline with them is, is what would they pay? And, and how would they want to pay? They, and and not, not just in terms of pure dollars, but do they want, want to pay monthly? Do they want to pay one time for life? Do they want to pay on a as use, using it basis, uh, daily basis, or, or by individual time? But have some of those conversations uh, uh, with these people on, on what they would pay. Now, that's one side. The other side is I'm these sorts of tools are sometimes things that you don't ultimately want to charge anybody for and put it out there for people uh, to use so that they can use it in a, uh, with a mass audience. Um, you know, may, maybe this is something where you want to make the tool free for everybody and, uh, and then target, uh, with, with some target marketing, get large groups using it and then hopefully it goes uh, you know, more viral that lots of people are using it and then bigger companies see it as something that they just want to add uh, to their, their offering. So in, I could certainly see a company like Google saying, hey, if there's hundreds of thousands of people using this tool, and yeah, it's free, and there's no money changing hands, but uh, there's hundreds of thousands of people using this tool every day, maybe there's something we should buy and just integrate as part of our browser offering or something like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I think it'd be good to have the conversations about what, what they would pay, but there's also another avenue that you could think about too as part of the market validation exercise. Mm -hmm. Now, Christine, you also indicated that um, you can pull any image from the web and just copy and paste it. Can you load up uh, other images? For example, our visual resources curator has purchased thousands of images that we use for teaching. Um, could uh, she dump those into image maps, which I then can take into the classroom and use? Because they're extremely high quality images. So they're in most cases, they're better than uh, what's out there on the web. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of your the database in your department, actually. I, I took a look at it. It's great. 
Um, currently, you can only um, you can only upload images that have a URL. Okay. But, uh, yeah. So this this functionality that you can upload images uh, out of your own collections or your own your own files essentially um, is something that we're going to work on in in the next phase. So the, this this current phase ends um, at the end of July, mm -hmm. and then um, I need to and and this is actually why this this conversation here is very timely. So then I need to either reapply for grants or find other ways of uh, financing this. And um, that is at the top of the priority list is to add that function to it that people can, that users can upload right from their own file. Okay. Yeah, because that, that would... Uh, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, for the, not only for teaching, because most of those images are available on the web, but... Uh, well, um, for those of us that, already. Yeah, those of us that work in rather obscure areas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, Christine, uh, c come into the Accelerator Center and uh, we can help you look at non-dilutive uh, funding options with uh, government... Uh, programs that you can get some money to accelerate your business and then we could also talk about uh, how to access the sort of local angel network of, of financing opportunities uh, as well so okay that's great and I would be coming into the Stratford accelerators and that's sure yeah, yeah great <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to just throw it to uh, Rosa just for kind of a final comment here around um, unique kind of unique challenges of academic inventors when it comes to intellectual property, is there anything that you think it's important to just highlight here as we're kind of nearing the close of our conversation? Just want to make sure you have a chance to speak to that. Sure, I think uh, one of the a couple things. Um, I guess when uh, when you're talking about downloading images off the web into image maps and using it that way, I guess you just have to be careful on IP infringement issues and making sure that people that are using image map aren't infringing third parties. Uh, IP rights that they have in the images that they're downloading. That was the one comment I wanted to make on the discussion that was happening earlier. Um, mm. Some of the ap academic uh, developers uh, and startups and entrepreneurs, one of the things that they have to be careful of, and, and University of Waterloo is uh, known for being very free in this area, but there are other university uh, academics that um, the university takes a very possessive right on any IP or rights or things that are developed by their professors. And so that is one thing that you have to be careful of when you're a professor and you're developing something uh, or starting something new, is what is your university policy uh, about uh, what is the university policy that's currently in place about who owns that and can you roll it out and can you commercialize it and can you do that in conjunction with the university without the university's input or does the university have to control that process and and there are some universities that are very controlling and very um, uh, want that ownership interest and will not allow commercialization without uh, them being involved Okay, thank you, Rosa. Christine had a comment there. Yeah, I uh, to to your last point about the University of Waterloo's um, IP policy. I would just like to say that um, I just wanted to point out how lucky we really are that we are um, doing this at the University of Waterloo. I've spoken to quite a few colleagues who have tried um, similar endeavors and have failed because, or have given up, I should say, because they, they were so frustrated with their own university's IP policies, which are much much more proprietary than than UW is, and um, that is actually, um, first of all, it's quite rare that universities have the IP policy where the IP stays with, with the researcher, not with the university. Um, and it is a, a huge gift, I think, to the community. So uh, a lot of, I'm sure David knows about this too, a lot of the startup companies that have come out of the university have been able to do so because, precisely because of the IP policy that we have. So that that's a... a, a uh, point well taken. I, I agree. Huge differentiator for our region over every other region. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 And a lot of universities that were very restrictive in the past are in the process of changing some of their policies yeah. to, to mirror uh, Waterloo's because they've seen the benefits that have come out of that in the community as well as for the university themselves. A lot of great developers have come out of University of Waterloo and that bodes well for the university. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, thanks everyone. This has been uh, a very rich conversation and I'm sure we could go on for another hour. Um, but we have to close our time for now and we have another hangout 
maybe next month, maybe uh, everyone will be part of that. I'm not sure. We'll see how that all uh, evolves. But um, I just wanted to get everyone to close, you know, 30 seconds or less. What's what's a key take home for you? Um, it may be something you've already shared or just something you've heard from someone else. Like what, what's that kind of key nugget that you're walking away from this conversation with? So we'll start with Christine. Um, well, I think that I have a lot of work ahead of me, <laughs> but it's all very exciting. <laughs> and um, and what I really learned is um, that uh, uh, the community in, in Kitchener Waterloo Stratford has a lot to offer in terms of help, so I will be taking advantage of it. Hmm. What about you, Joan? What's uh, a key, uh, key take home for you? Uh, the, uh, this is a great platform for uh, collaboration and, and sharing and, and getting a lot of the information that we have stashed away in our offices out um, and being used by other people effectively. Mm -hmm. Hmm. David, what about you? Yeah, I guess uh, two comments. First of all, um, I haven't used it yet, but when I saw it on the video, it actually seemed like a very worthwhile tool uh, that I could see using in, in various situations. And, and then listening to Joan, it sounds like it's uh, there's a customer base there already that, that uh, sees the value in this. So, so that is a big plus for a startup uh, right there, having people that see it as valuable. Mm -hmm. um, I think the next step uh, for Christine would be to uh, start to really focus on a uh, market validation exercise, uh, going through some of the things I said off the top, looking at the value proposition of it, what the differentiating features are, and, and some of those things, looking at pricing and, and uh, getting to market and, and those sort of questions um, and certainly there's there's many resources around the community uh, not the least of which is the Stratford Accelerator Center that uh, people like Christine and others can utilize so thank you David Rosa you have the final final word great just the way I like it um, I <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that uh, the key thing is always to uh, be sure to protect your IP um, and um, and be sure to make your house uh, make sure your house is in order. Uh, David commented about the fact that you know there are angel networks, there are investors willing to invest in startups and help them get to the next level. Uh, there's a lineup at their door of people that need money and want to get to the next level. And uh, if your house is in order as a startup, um, basic things like making sure your minute book's in order, you have your NDA signed, you have your employment agreement signed, you have your IP assignment signed by all your employees and contractors. If all those basic things are in order, you're one step ahead of some other startups, then you're more likely to uh, be the next person that people finance or, or see as an acquisition target. Well, thank you all, and um, again, I really appreciate all your expertise and insights. I'm sure Christine did, and I'm sure all our viewers uh, who participated live or, or are watching this on the YouTube channel. There's a lot of kind of rich insights to glean from this, and uh, this video is, will be posted on the Commerce Lab YouTube channel as well. I'm sure there will be a link from commercelab.ca to the video and also shared through social media. So again, uh, please visit commercelab.ca for more information on upcoming Hangouts. And uh, if you have suggestions for featured speakers or topics, please share them with us. We'd be happy to, uh, to dig into those topics with you. Again, uh, thanks again, and uh, we're going to say goodbye for now. Thanks for inviting us. Thanks. Thank you.